Hello, and welcome to Episode 9 of the Aquarius Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Reed. As I believe most of you listening to this know, Episode 8 with Greg Steves focused on the CARES program and the great work they are doing to help preserve at-risk fish species. Well, my local club, the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society, just so happened to have a vacancy for the CARES program committee chair position. And given that I was looking for a way to be more involved with my local club, I decided to offer myself up for the job. So, yours truly is now the CARES committee chairperson. Fingers crossed that I don't somehow goof this responsibility. So what exactly will I be doing as the CARES committee chairperson? Great question. Initially, I will be in charge of the review and approval of CARES species for GSAS club members, and also a quarterly submission of the GSAS database, basically an updated list of who has what species, to the main CARES body. I'm sure that I will have one or two article submissions throughout the year to our monthly club newsletter, all with the goal of building participation in this program. So wish me luck, everyone. And now, before we get on to the interview, I would like to thank everyone who has subscribed, liked, or is following this podcast. If you aren't already doing so, like and follow the Aquarius Podcast Facebook page as well. It is fantastic to see that so many people are enjoying the podcast. Now, on to the interview. Today is Tuesday, March 20th, 2018. I'm joined by Sam Rutka. Sam is the freshwater manager of a fish and pet store called Easy Aquariums, which is located in Gorham, Maine. Sam is also a plant specialist and an aquascaper who does both traditional aquarium aquascapes and paludariums. As if Sam didn't have enough aquarium street cred, he's also served as a volunteer aquarist at the New England Aquarium and is sitting on a committee to revamp Maine's highly restrictive approved species list, which basically means that Maine can only have 1% of what is normally available to the average hobbyist in the United States. Sam, thank you very much for joining me tonight on the Aquarist Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, and for everybody out there, um, Sam and I, you know, we've had to reschedule a couple times. Um, you know, unfortunately, Sam, so Sam is in Maine, which is a fortunate thing. It's a beautiful state, and I'd love to go visit sometime. Uh, but recently, you know, with the date being March 20th, uh, we are now in the first day of spring. Maine has just been getting pounded and pounded with snowstorms. So we've had to reschedule a couple times. Sam's lost power. Um, there's been threats of power outages. So we wanted to make sure we could do a full episode. And actually tonight, I think you guys are going to get pounded again with snow. So hopefully we can make Make this episode happen. Yeah, I really appreciate how flexible you've been with the rescheduling. You can't can't quite plan around the weather all the time. Yeah, no worries, man. I'm not offering any financial compensation, so you're purely a volunteer to me. I will reschedule <laughs> as many times as you need. Um, so, Sam, one thing I didn't mention in the in the opening, um, and I'm glad that uh, earlier while we were talking, you said it was okay. Um, your nickname on Instagram and your avatar, I have found to be absolutely fantastic when I was reaching out to you, um, and that is Captain Duckweed, which I think in the aquarium world <laughs> is probably the greatest nickname out there. So before we dive too deep into this interview, uh, can you give me the background on Captain Duckweed? Happy to, yeah. So I'm a I'm a firm believer in not picking your own nickname, and this was actually... Uh, bequeathed i guess you could say upon me by my customers whenever i'm walking around the store or talking to people uh, i'm talking with my hands and of course inevitably my arms are covered in duckweed that's drying from when i was reaching in the tanks and it's just flying everywhere so people just started saying hey captain duckweed you're getting duckweed everywhere you go it's it's how they know how to find me <laughs> just follow the trail of duckweed and you will right. inevitably find sam somewhere my uh, my embarrassing story about duckweed is, you know, this is my first, uh, as my listeners know, this is my, you know, foray back into the aquarium hobby after being out for, I don't know, close to close to a decade um, of when I previously kept uh, multiple tanks. And before I had never kept a single live plant in my tank whatsoever. Um, it was all fake plants. I was all about cichlids and Oscars and all that stuff anyway. So um, they would tear it up. And when I heard about duckweed and how, um, you know, it's a nuisance, you know, as somebody just starting out with plants and hearing how difficult it is to keep them, you know, stupid me said, well, I'll like, I'd like some duckweed. Yeah, I'll take that. And maybe I can grow it. You know, let's, let's see how successful I can be. Um, well, my breeding for karma 10 gallon tank, I cannot get rid of duckweed. So I am. <laughs> yeah, it's <laughs> one of those things you're like, oh, I'll try it out. And if I don't like it, I'll get rid of it. No problem. Well, no, once you get it, it's it's with you for life. And, it, and, uh, it's, and it's amazing. Maybe we need to have, uh, you know, you and I, we can contact a botanist or somebody that knows, but this, 
you know, the sticky, viscous property of the duckweed, um, how as you try to scoop it out with a net, it won't leave the net when you try to, to put it into a bucket. Can't shake it you, off. You can't shake it off. It is amazing. Like, we almost need to replace Velcro with duckweed, and that might be, like, our new, like, type of ad- adhesion. I don't, I don't know, but duckweed is some pretty amazing stuff. I feel like if it, Captain Duckweed w- were to be an uh, illustrated superhero, maybe he could climb buildings like Spider-Man because of its ability to cling to surfaces. <laughs> that is fantastic. So if you could, if you could get on that 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 comic book series, um, I will be. Yeah, any you. animators out there, I would love to see that. That would be amazing. Yeah. In the meantime, you can check out Sam on his Instagram page. Follow him um, and all of his duckweed adventures, and you could check out this really cool avatar that I'm talking about. So, Sam, why don't you give us all a background on um, on you and the hobby? So, how old were you when you first got started? And just kind of walk us through that that progression to the point where you you know started really taking this seriously, um, or you know when you turned professional, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm one of the rare occurrences where my introduction to the hobby wasn't actually a fish tank, but my mother and I dug a pond in our backyard because. I grew up watching home and garden television with my mother, you know, playing out in the garden, just growing up in Maine, surrounded by all these beautiful plants. It's a great opportunity to spend some time in nature and kind of create something like that, even though you only have about four days to do it before it gets cold again. So we went out and we dug a pond, and my favorite thing to do was just to go out there and and arrange the plants and, and put the moss around it. And then soon I learned about other things that can go in the water, like fish and uh, turtles, and and that's kind of where it started. And from there, you know, inevitably winter comes by, and I wanted to bring it inside, and that's kind of how I really discovered the convenience, I guess you could say, of aquariums, to be able to bring my pond from outside into the home and enjoy year-round. And from there, you know, it started with goldfish and stuff that I could get really cheaply or, or win at a fair or something like that. And, and then it, of course, progressed. But each time, I think my main focus for each tank was how can I incorporate plants? And, of course, if it was a tank with goldfish, I would have plants sticking out of the top of the tanks with the roots hanging in or uh, my first round with black-skirted tetras. I could take some hornwort, which is also a plant that it grows naturally out here in Maine. And uh, you can put that in, and and it lasts a little bit longer than another plant with goldfish would otherwise. But uh, I was able to enjoy that up through high school, and then, of course, took a break in college because it's hard to move around with that. And college didn't work for me as well as it does for some. So after that, I just kind of bounced around. And uh, But I've been fortunate enough to, to settle into a, a stable location where you can set up a tank so you're not constantly on the move. Oh, that's fantastic. Uh, to go back to your you know, childhood experiences, um, did you ever get involved in any breeding? And, I, and how bad did multiple tank syndrome afflict you? Well, the, it wasn't so much breeding so much as I wanted individual ecosystems. So I, I wasn't after creating more and more fish so much as creating more and more living dioramas throughout my room so that I could look at them. And that, of course, meant that size is kind of an issue. Even your average child room, though it might be getting bigger these days, you only have so much space. So if it meant a couple mason jars with some fish and some plants, or if it meant that used 10-gallon that you found next to the garbage for some reason on Wednesday and you brought that home and filled it up and put some sand in there from the river and saw what wiggled out of it the next day... um, it was mostly stuff like that. I didn't really find a whole lot of full setup aquariums until a little bit later. And then we had things like um, different types of, of goldfish, but no tanks really got much larger than 55 gallons. But there was always a lot of jars throughout the rooms. So what would you say was your inspiration? You know, you, you called these these living dioramas. Um, was this you on your own as a kid trying to mimic ma- nature, or was there some... Uh, resource, be it, uh, you know, in the early days of the internet or some books from the library? No, it was 
we didn't really have much of an internet. I assure you, we did have it in Maine. I just didn't necessarily have it personally. But um, I preferred to just look at the stuff. I wasn't really reading about it necessarily at this point in my life. I I just wanted to have it near me so that I could just observe it and, and see how it goes. And mostly just to see the interaction between plants and animals. It, I always found it really baffling just to see something that's moving around at a speed that I can discern and how it interacts with something that moves so incredibly slowly that I can't really see any change until the next day when I wake up in the morning. And I always found that really fascinating. And that just made me want to bring it inside so that I could keep staring at it to see if I could maybe see it move or something like that. But um, I've always been really fascinated with the connection between plants and animals in that way. Now, I know this may not have been your motivation, but as a kid, did you notice um, regarding kind of your water quality and, and your water parameters um, that, you know, having these plants, these living plants in the aquarium, um, you know, meant that you didn't have to do as much water changes? Uh, did that thought ever cross your mind? Like, were you, were you making that connection? So it's funny, um, you know, you look back on your childhood and, and it's hard to say if things are just the way you remember them, but... Um, I was talking to somebody the other day about water quality. I don't ever remember having any issues with water quality at all, which leads me to believe that my brother or my sister or my mother was swooping in when something started to go slightly wrong and saving the day without me knowing, because there's no way it ran as smoothly as I remember it running. I don't know if you're packing in a lot of those plants in there. Maybe, uh, you know, maybe you were just, you know, you were onto it, but you just had no idea. But if not, your uh, your family is very loving that they would that they would go through that hassle for you. It they certainly are, and uh, but it is amazing just how much plants can offer uh, as far as stability within the tank, balancing the chemicals uh, and those parameters. And if it can, you know, it it might be a great idea now that you mention it to put more of those things like philodendrons and pothos growing out of children's tanks. Maybe that would help a lot with the frustration factor. Yeah, that's a good point right there. Um, you know, the pothos, I, I, I think everybody likes seeing the, the pothos, you know, on top of the aquarium and, and doing its thing, growing all um, every which way. But also from what I've heard, the pothos just will, you know, gobble up all the, you know, ammonia and, and nitrites and nitrates and, and does a fantastic job of helping to keep your, uh, your water quality stable compared to other, um, you know, possible plants that you can have in the aquarium. So we should start that campaign and see what happens. Absolutely. And that, and if I may just take a, a little tangent on that very point, one of my favorite things about plants is the reason the pothos, for example, does such a great job at sucking that excess nutrient out of the water is because it's grown immersed above the water's surface. It has a higher percentage of carbon dioxide available to it so that it can grow faster. It can create more mass from that compound and suck up more of that nutrients, cleaning the tank faster than a plant regular underwater because the concentration is just a little bit lower. Yeah, that is a good point. And so on that should I apologize to the duckweed that I curse as I try to constantly pull it out of this 10-gallon in front of me? <laughs> no, not at all. Um, it, every tank is, you know, to each their own, and there's nothing wrong with that. I just like to tell, you know, my customers and clients and friends, if you do throw away the duckweed, maybe dry it out and mix it into the garden bed. There's great nutrients there. There's no sense in wasting it. Unless you're really frustrated and there's therapeutic value to that, I have no issue with that either. Yeah, that, that's a very good point. Uh, when I do my water changes, when I'm not dumping directly from a python hose into uh, my bathtub drain, on my smaller tanks, I will use, uh, you know, the Home Depot size five-gallon buckets, um, and I'll take that water that has all the good, you know, fish nutrients in it, or the fish leavings, if you will, and I will try mm -hmm. to, uh, you know, gingerly uh, pour that water into our flower bed. Yeah, I, um, I've even, I dip my bonsais in the buckets great way to water them. Um, of course, I don't recommend that for all bonsais. There are a lot of sensitive root balls out there. But, you know, if you've got like a ficus benjamina, go ahead, dip that in the in your old tank water. It'll do pretty good, pretty good work. 
Yeah, bonsai is something that has always interested me. Uh, interested me. I've never gotten into it, and you've almost just opened up a can of worms of talking about bonsai <laughs> on this tropical fish podcast. But we're gonna we're gonna digress. We're gonna step back a little bit, <laughs> and maybe we'll have that Absolutely. on a future episode. Uh, but nonetheless, plants though, uh, plants regardless. Um, you know, obviously in the intro, talking a lot about your experience uh, dealing with. Uh, plants, obviously your your nickname being Captain Duckweed. So how did you then kind of pivot into this like plant specialist aquascaper role? Well, it, it really, I guess, fundamentally comes down to my just trying to recreate the perfect vision of an underwater world just like when I was a kid so that I can sit there and stare at it for countless hours on end. Um, and if I can make that for other people to enjoy, then all the better, you know, I just, it, I enjoyed precariously placing pieces of moss in my pond growing up. And, and now I like to do the exact same thing in my, in my aquarium or my polydarium or terrarium, just making each plant just so so that I know what direction it's going to grow, I know what it's going to cover, about how long it's going to take in relation to other plants within the tank, and then to top it all off, to put an animal in there that will interact with it in real time just makes for a perfect equation for me, and I just love to watch that. Yeah, that's a really funny point that that that's, uh, that you're bringing up, at least in, in my head, that as I think about this, that um, for those that listen to this show, and maybe you're kind of picking up on this um, at, you know, as you talk to me, but what I really find enjoyment with uh, keeping tropical fish is, you know, the breeding aspect, the challenge of breeding, uh, the enjoyment of, you know, when the fish reproduce um, and, you know, everything that that entails, uh, the good animal husbandry to give them, you know, the sense of security that, yes, you know, I'm getting enough food, I'm in a comfortable environment, I can breed and reproduce and have healthy offspring. So that's really enjoyable for me. Um, and again, this time around, I am really enjoying the planted aspect of it. And I like to see my plants do well. Um, but you know, your enjoyment from the same hobby though is different. We both have the same end, end result of, you know, we are enjoying aquariums, glass boxes with plants and fish in them. Um, uh, but we're, we're each kind of taking something a little bit different out of it. Um, and so I think that's something very unique about this hobby, um, and very enjoyable actually, you know, the fact that, you know, you can be, uh, in a different spot than I am in the hobby, yet we're still getting the same enjoyment from, uh, from the same activity. Absolutely. I, it's almost a universal language uh, with so many different uh, variations within it. You know, we're, we're coming at it from different angles. I have fish in there to fertilize my plants. You have plants in there to make your fish feel comfortable. Either way, we have a beautiful living piece of artwork in front of us. And uh, something I'm always saying to my customers that can sound a little counterintuitive is, the more hiding places you give your fish, the more frequently you will see them. So put more plants in there and you'll see your fish more often because they're more confident in the ability to retreat somewhere and feel safe and contained. And then they'll be able to come out more knowing that. Yeah, and also the you know the color popping, having those the the different shades of green or, or whatever the shade of the the plant may be, um, you know, it's just going to add that different dimension to your viewing experience of the of the fish as opposed to just having them in a very bare aquarium where, you know, uh, I'm not going to knock you if you've got the bare aquarium, but you know, hey, try try some plants, you know, to really help bring out the color in your fish as well. Yeah, and and if you want to talk about the connection with plants and color of fish after the leaves fall off the trees and land into the water and, and tint it, you get these beautiful colors in these fish that in the wild would be existing in waters as dark as, as a really deep tea color. You know, the Rio Negro, for example, with these cardinal tetras, you put some botanicals in the bottom of your tank, maybe some that you get from like tannin aquatics, or if you can go out and just find some great oak leaves yourself that are nice and dry in the autumn, you can sink those down, get your water a nice rich tea color, make those fish right at home and those colors really come to life for you. Yeah, that's a very good tip right there. Um, so 
again, talking, you know, keeping in the aquascaping theme, you know, how does how does somebody get a hold of you if they want to enlist your services? Um, one, I would say I would highly encourage people to check out your, your Instagram page for some of the uh, the pictures that you have posted on there. Um, you know, follow you so you can see the, the work that you're doing. But if, you know, I'm in the, the general New England area that's within, you know, your, your area of service, um, you know, what, what kind of services do you offer um, and how do we get a hold of you? Yeah, so I am a proud member of the Easy Aquariums family in Gorham, Maine. You can find us on Facebook at Easy Aquariums. Um, of course, you can come by. We're just 15 minutes west of Portland, Maine. And you can find us on Facebook. Check us out on Instagram. And I'm there five days a week and often on my day off. You can find me there. What we offer is some servicing options, but mostly we like to bring to the table some custom installations that you really don't find everywhere else. So I build a lot of custom polydariums or terrariums, aquariums. If you want just to come by and talk shop and ask some questions, or if you want me to come out to your house and, and aquascape a tank for you, I'm happy to do that either way. Um, we have a great time at at the shop and we have a big pond in the background that's for 864 gallons and we're going to be building another pond towards the front that's going to be over a thousand gallons for a big red tail catfish oh nice that sounds awesome um so it, regarding the the services that you offer um aquarium aquas, aquascaping uh, creating paludariums w- would you say there's a certain style that you have when you create these yeah, um, I try when I'm building tanks for customers. I try to figure out what they're seeing when they picture it in their mind as best I can and create that. But of course, as with anything, we always put our own personal flair on things, whether it's conscious or subconscious. And I guess I'm noticing more and more that I like to put for aquascapes, I really like small, almost underwater bonsai trees. Um, I like to create things that look like they might be in something like a coniferous forest. I like a lot of deep, dark greens. Um, Cryptocrine is a fantastic plant to work with for that reason. It's got a bunch of different shades of green. You can get a lot of different lengths and different textures even in the leaf patterns. And you can, you can really give a lot of good shadow and depth because that plant doesn't necessarily, well, that family of plants doesn't necessarily need as much light as something else. So you can kind of sneak them in where there might be a little bit of overcast from some hardscape above it. And then, so on your paludariums, is there a certain style that you take from that? Um, and, And I'm asking that as I look at your Instagram pictures and I just, I get overwhelmed with this sense of jungle. Like, and it's a good type of overwhelm because I'm blown away. Um, and, you know, knowing knowing what I can do from an aquarium aquascaping, like to me, this feels like next level stuff um, that I could only dream of. But it just looks that rich and vibrant. Like you, you carved out a little slice of the jungle um, and, you, and you just put it right there um, in this picture frame for me. Well, thank you very much. Yeah, I like to almost think of it just like you said, like a almost cartoonish laser beam, just taking a cross section of some river bank or, or some jungle or forest floor somewhere, and then surrounding it by glass and putting it on a table. Uh, but you asked specifically about polydariums, and I guess I've noticed that when I build polydariums, I'm always trying to create a eroded river bank. I feel like that's just a, a great natural look and there's so much potential for different animals to climb all over branches and you can go almost any direction with a hardscape, which is basically a wall with big sticks branching out of it and a bunch of little caves and, and you can make it an arid scape if it's a terrarium or you can go all the way to rainforest jungle or if it's a submerged scape in an in a aquarium. You can even make it like some kind of cichlid shell dweller tank all the way to the black ghost knife fish. They love those caves and those little crannies. They feel great in and amongst all the, the sticks and twigs. So it's kind of a great jumping off point if you're just assembling the hardscape of a tank to kind of picture a, 
the eroded riverbank. That's always where my mind goes, I guess. Mm -hmm. So let's talk, let's turn this into kind of paludarium, you know, 101 or your, you know, your lessons learned as you've, um, you know, dived into building this type of, um, type of ecosystem. Like what are, what are some of the lessons learned that, um, you've encountered and that you've, uh, made note of and what are things that somebody wanting to get into this? Cause I, I, I see myself, um, one of these days wanting to do one of these setups, uh, but not, not right now. So, I mean, this is definitely something where I usually jump head first, but just looking at these pictures and seeing how, how gorgeous they are, I know that there's gotta be a lot of work that goes into that. Um, or maybe dispel some, some misconceptions about them. Yeah, so some tips and tricks that I wish I was told early on. One, expanding pond foam does not stick to glass. So if you build this whole big, beautiful wall with rocks and sticks and you spray foam it in, it sticks when it's wet. But as it cures, eventually it pulls away from the glass. And I have had an entire wall that I just built just fall forward and break the glass. It's an awful feeling. It can be a very expensive mistake. So keep in mind, expanding pond foam will not stick to glass. Is that the typical medium that's used for the uh, the wall aspect? It's one of a few um, that I use personally. I There are so many different ways to build these. Uh, even just a cursory search on Google, you can see all the different opinions everybody has on how to assemble these. And Again, you know, everything that I say is just my personal experience, but I like to use great stuff, pond and stone. It's already gray. It's pretty easy to work with. However, it will not come off your hands. Well, it will, but when it comes off your hands, it takes the skin with it. So just keep that in mind. Uh, it's recommended to wear gloves when using that product because it will stay with you for a while. So, so, but, um, so, so far, your two major lessons learned I really like, and I think they're super valuable because one, it's this, if you don't do this, or if this happens to you, you will break the aquarium, <laughs> which... Yeah, that's, try to that's, avoid that's, it yeah, if you yeah, can. Yeah, avoid that. Uh, number two so far has been, it's going to save you your skin. <laughs> so, I think you're giving yeah, very valuable lessons. Yeah, that's important to you. Yeah. So, those are incredibly valuable lessons learned. So, uh, continue if you've got a couple more. Absolutely. Um, to... So you might be thinking, well, if I build this whole thing with pond foam, how the heck am I going to stick it to the glass? The secret there that I found was if you take, and again, this is just what I've experienced myself, that I, I want to throw out as many um, caveats as I can. Please don't come yelling at me if it doesn't work. There's a lot of experimentation that has to take place. Unless you but, feel like um, you have too much skin and you have too much money, then go ahead and you know, don't take Sam's Absolutely. advice. Absolutely. <laughs> Please experiment and let me know what works for you because maybe, maybe we can brainstorm on some better techniques together. But um, what I'll do is on the glass where I want to adhere some kind of structure with the foam, I will put silicone, aquarium grade silicone. I've also found that the black silicone tends to stick a little bit stronger to some materials like wood and rock than the clear stuff. But it, they both hold fairly well for me in my experience. So you'll put almost like a cleat of the silicone, just some lines, almost like a glue stick, and then spray the foam to that, and it will adhere to the silicone, which will adhere to the glass. So it's almost uh, like an adapter, but you can hold that structure in place with the foam and the silicone on the glass safely. No, that sounds like a very valuable tip right there. Again, in my experience. <laughs> and then as far as like sourcing the plants for these. So, um, you know, it, it's, I don't, I don't want to say it's difficult, but you know, it's, it's one thing to source plants that are going to be just purely submerged. Um, now you're starting to play with things that are a little submerged and immersed, right? And then you've got some plants that are fully um, out of the water and maybe they're, they're going to be a little humid at most, uh, but they're not going to, they're not going to actually be rooted in the water or exposed to the water, like the, like the submerged plants. So, um, how does plant selection go and, and, you know, what are good resources to actually find these, the variety of plants that you need? Yeah. So for me, um, I learned a lot through trial and error. If you can get your access on your hands on any plants that you can access, 
put them in your tank, try them out in different spots, you know, do a little reading online. Um, try to find sources that you feel a little bit more confident in before you take too much, uh, credence, but there are a lot of different plants that you can look up and you're saying, Oh, this one needs a lot of airflow. So make sure that you give that some airflow. If you have a fan, put it near there. If you have a screen near the top, put it there. Um, this plant wants its feet wet, as I like to say. It, it, it wants its roots to be in the water, but it doesn't want the whole root ball to be in the water because then it'll just kind of suffocate and rot. Uh, for me, the best way was to just kind of experiment around with it. But some resources that you can find online, um, of course, you can Google, but I like local garden shops. Um, there's one near us. O'Donnell's Nursery. They have a great little pond section. Um, I can go there. I can look at some marginal plants that they have available. Um, I know there's a lot of different websites out there that you can check out, and they'll have a little bit of information at the bottom. But I find the best way to do it is go out there, find a plant you like, and and see where it's happiest. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's very good uh, pointer. So then for the for the ones that will be fully submerged, obviously you can go through your normal channels of, you know, who you would procure um, normal aquarium plants for. But then the, you know, your the ones where you're, like you said, your feet are getting wet, uh, maybe more of what's uh, what's available from like a pond kind of specialty or landscaping store. And then some of these ones that are fully um, out of the water, their feet are not even wet. Those actually look like, you know, some of the local nurseries, like you're saying, you know, the ones that it's not going to be a big box store, nothing against Home Depot or Lowe's, but uh, they're not going to carry some of the more exotic plants. Um, like I think what I'm looking at here in the, the paludarium examples that you have. Uh, but I certainly know that a couple of my, I don't want to call them higher end, but, you know, the definitely the more specialty mom and pop land, um, uh, gardening stores, you know, the, these, a lot of these plants look very familiar. Um, so I would imagine then you could probably source, like you're saying, a lot from there. Absolutely. And you can actually find some species uh, at ter certain times of the year. You can find some species at these big box stores. But keep in mind, you want to do a little bit of research or as much as you can before you're turned down uh, to see if they're using any pesticides on their products. Uh, it, that might be in the soil. So maybe if you do buy a plant from one of the big box stores, it's a good idea to give it as a nice rinse, uh, change out the soil, uh, but just do a little bit of research on that before you put it into an environment that might affect your animals. So it'll obviously vary depending on where you are and who your local um, uh, specialty garden store is. But in your experience, your local specialty garden stores, they don't have the same um, likelihood of using pesticides as like the big box stores will? Uh, in some cases, they do. Uh, you just need to keep an eye out for signage or ask somebody that works there. Um, in my experience, I've had great luck with the marginal plants uh, just out of the gate. Those are already in. They're on display in a situation where it would be detrimental to animals. So I, I don't think that's anything necessarily to concern yourself with there, as opposed to a bigger situation where they're moving a lot of one species of plant, like a whole big huge truck of pothos you know where they would where they would spray but just a little bit of of research while you're purchasing these things and and it'll go a long way yeah no because i mean last thing you want to do is i would imagine the pesticides will be more uh detrimental to the livestock right um maybe not so much to the other plants or would it would it affect both it can. I mean, there are some fish that are hardier than others, and there are plants that are hardier than others. So it's all going to come down to concentrations and and who is more affected by what compound. But usually, if you can avoid that kind of variable, it's preferred. But it's, it's rarely an issue. Um, I just want to make sure that all bases are covered. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, and one of the but things... Something Oh, Sorry to interrupt, no, but no. one place that you can usually get plants that you can be confident aren't dosed in pesticides or, or where you can really get some inside information on how these plants were grown, friends in the hobby, clubs. If there's a club near you, go to a meeting. They usually have auctions. You can buy plants from other hobbyists and really learn how that plant was grown, what that plant might require, and it's great to get 
information direct from the grower that way and really know what you're grabbing. That is such a great plug. I've actually changed how I do my a little outro, if that's what it's even called, when I conclude an interview and I and I wrap up an episode, just a quick little one-minute section that I have. I've changed it now to basically say, get out there, join your fish club, be, get active. Um, because, you know, the once-a-month meetings, they're action-filled. Um, there's a lot of content. There's a lot of great people. Uh, people from all walks of life, you know, are in the fish club. Um, so that's always an enjoyable experience. Um, and then, yeah, the, the auctions and then, uh, being able to source not just the fish, but the plants as well. Um, you know, there's the, the horticulturist award program, the HAPS as they're called, um, where people, you know, get points and they get, you know, street cred, if you will, for breeding all sorts of different or propagating all sorts of different plants. So that is a super valuable resource, um, to, like you said, you know, locally grown, locally sourced plants that you know exactly what the conditions were. And it's great to, as a fish hobbyist, I know all too well what it's like to talk to someone and just see their eyes glaze over and they're like, oh yeah, plants, great, hooray. Um, it's nice to talk to people that are sharing that common interest with you. So it's definitely worth it. If there's a club nearby, swing in for a meeting. And if there's not, maybe start one. Yeah, I mean, that's going to be a whole other episode in and of itself. But definitely, if you're in an area where you don't have the benefit of, you know, the Missouri Aquarium Society or like me with the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society or wherever you are that doesn't have an established fish club. Uh, but hey, if you, if you have a local fish store and there's regulars, there's a good chance you might be able to coax them maybe with a free pizza and some sodas um, at your local roundtable to, you know, meet and talk about fish once a month, you know, and it, it's going to be an investment and it's going to be a, a, you know, a marathon, but yeah, start a fish club, you know, if you want, if you want a terrible guest speaker, you know, I'll come out, <laughs> I'll come out and hey, talk it, at your newly formed fish club. <laughs> it's a wonderful thing. I love speaking at fish clubs. I have a great time. The people are great. Uh, it's just so nice to be surrounded by other people that are interested in the same thing that you are. Yeah, you would, uh, you would much rather have Captain Duckweed as one of your speakers than uh, the Aquarius podcast host, Randy Reed. I think you're doing just <laughs> fine. <laughs> oh, well, thank you very much. I appreciate it. All right. So, you know, one of the things that you had brought up earlier um, on this topic of paludariums, and I'm probably still pronouncing that wrong, is airflow. So that's something that, you know, we don't necessarily have to deal with in the aquarium hobby unless your, you know, your tank is um, smelling and your spouse is upset and you need airflow in your fish room. But then, you know, you need to go back and, and figure out why your tank is stinking. Um, so is, is there any more to unpack around airflow? Um, I would argue that the most important aspect of your tank, whether it's a polydarium or a terrarium or even an aquarium, is knowing what the animal that lives inside it will require. So, for example, I have one polydarium that I keep pretty tightly sealed. I mean, I wouldn't say it's sealed, but, you know, I want the humidity to be really, really high, and I don't need as much airflow. And so for that, I have a little vent, and that's it. No fan, just, just a vent, so it's like really passive airflow, uh, but it keeps the humidity high. If you have, say, a chameleon in your terrarium, you want to have a lot of airflow through that. You want to make sure there's some really good ventilation. So if it's in a tank where it's not going to get that exchange, by which I mean that there's just not enough surface area, like it's not all screen, then just putting an exhaust fan uh, of varying sizes and a small little fan that you can find on like Amazon or eBay, a uh, little computer fan, they can move quite a bit of air. Um, and they're pretty quiet, considering. And uh, you can use that to just vent out a tank really quick, exchange that air, get some fresh air in there. And um, some of them you can even get um, hydrostats that will turn on or off depending what uh, percent humidity it is or there's thermostats that'll turn on and off depending on what temperature it is so you can really dial in your ventilation these days fairly cost effective yeah and so and so you know this is what really to me feels like something where um, i need to do a lot more research and i'm not saying that to scare people away but 
I don't know, I feel like there's just something about the way that I can keep an aquarium where, you know, sure, I do a lot of research and I want to make sure that I have um, everything that I want, you know, for that particular aquarium. But I feel like I've got a lot more um, wiggle room, if you will, where I feel like when I jump into my paludarium, um, there's so many things that I'm going to want to consider um, that, you know, just the amount of research that I'm going to want to do to make sure that I do this right. Because I feel like once you start going, you know, above the waterline, like I want it to be really, really dialed in and, you know, or I might just have to fly you out to Seattle and have you help me. I would <laughs> love to come out to Seattle. But, um, and one thing I want to say is, for me, it was the other way around. When you're working with an aquarium, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, my throat is really dry. You got a little duckweed in there. A little bit. <laughs> Clear the duckweed out. Right? Okay, sorry about that. One thing I did want to say was, for me, in the aquarium, it was different because these fish, they're not just breathing the atmosphere, they're they're breathing the water. Uh, the water doesn't just flow in and out of the aquarium. You have to be the one to change it. So if something's going wrong with the water they breathe, uh, there's it's not going to necessarily correct itself, whereas a cage with a terrestrial animal, they're sharing the air that I'm breathing. And it, it, it's almost like an automatic air exchange, water change parallel for me, if that makes any sense. No, yeah, I mean, that's definitely a, a different way to look at it, yeah. So when, when I guess, it really reduces the amount of stress for me knowing that the if I have some airflow or appropriate ventilation, I have a little bit more wiggle room. I feel with terrestrial life than I would with aquatic life because they can't really get away from it if something is to go wrong. So I'm curious now, what, what is the, uh, what's the, they, so let's talk about some of the terrestrial critters that you keep in your paludariums. <laughs> so there is a lot of debate out there on what can and cannot be kept in paludariums or terrariums. And that's even true of aquariums. Um, you know, there's always somebody who's going to say, you can keep this fish with that, but you can't with this. That being said, um, I enjoy keeping dart frogs in my polydariums. Uh, I've not experienced any issues with dart frog drowning. I've been keeping dart frogs in polydariums for over five years. Uh, it's never been an issue. Not to say it doesn't happen out there. It just hasn't happened to me. Okay, so dart, um, dart frog drowning is going to be the concern as opposed to like dart, dart frog ate the tetra in the water. Yeah, no, that's not really a concern. If you have a fish in there and the dart frog fits in its mouth, definitely avoid that at all costs. Um, no bony tongue fish with frogs. They love frogs. But uh, knowing what can live with what is very important when keeping your animals. But I like to keep dart frogs in my polydariums. Um, I have kept morning geckos. I've kept uh, crested geckos, toke geckos, a uh, bunch of different tree frogs. Just keeping in mind that different polydariums can have more space with land or less space with land. They're all different designs and types that you can build for a lot of different animals that you can choose from. What's a pretty popular animal to keep in a polydarium? I feel like that's pretty localized. Uh, if you look at different parts of, well, let's just say the planet, you know, in Japan, uh, what they might be keeping in their polydariums or terrariums might be different than what, what they're keeping in Germany. I know that right now, where I am in the Northeast, dart frogs, I think, are definitely increasing in popularity. You're starting to see them more and more in different places. I know in Maine they were made recently legal uh, I was, just I was a few just gonna, years ago. I was just going to ask about that. Like, I hope, yeah. I hope we're not jinxing it. Yeah, we just it. got them. Yeah, I hope we're not jinxing this, and all of a sudden there's, you know, the, the dart frog is removed from the whitelist. Or, or how did the dart frog make it to your restrictive whitelist? Uh. <laughs> Well, by not being on the list, you can't have it. So it was never added, but it's added now. Gotcha, gotcha, yep. I was getting my uh, white and black list mixed up there. 
Yeah, yeah. No, I, I wish we had the blacklist. But at any rate, um, that's a big limiting factor for me personally and my polydariums. Uh, so there's there's a lot of information out there on different animals you can keep in different ways. And that I feel like that could be an entirely different topic. Yeah, so just uh, one last note on this. What is your bucket list critter paludarium that you would keep? Oh, wow. Um, I have so many. But... <laughs> <laughs> Will they all fit in one? No, no, it, it has to be multiple different ones. <laughs> all right, you're on, the, you're on the spot. you got to pick one. Which, which is the one that you just you, you're, you have to keep? Now, is it one that is actually feasible legally, or can it be like something from a zoo? Oh, no, no. Well, let, let's go with the zoo. Anything you want. Okay. I would love to build a polydarium with a three-toed sloth in it. <laughs> so it would be a representation of the flooded forest of the Amazon with a three-toed sloth in it hanging out. You know, of course, he wouldn't be in the flood in Amazon the whole time. I would want to be able to drop it way down for a dry season, too. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, so you need to win what – does Maine participate in Powerball? Can you get in on that action? <laughs> Probably, but uh, that that's my that's my dream setup. I want to have an ebb and flow – Amazonian system with a three-toed sloth. Wow, I was not thinking. I was not thinking with my head in the clouds there. I was thinking you're just going to name <laughs> off some exotic gecko or you know some other uh, highly poisonous, illegal, you know, nuclear amped up dart frog. But you went, uh, you went, you went sloth on me. <laughs> I went all the way. Yeah. Um, so I guess to answer that one, I would say there's a really cool morning gecko out there. I love morning geckos, um, but there's like a bright blue one. And I would love to have a bunch of those. So that's your more realistic bucket list paludarium critter. Yeah, my more realistic that can still cost up to five hundred dollars a head. Oh wow! Okay. Yeah. So yeah. if anyone's got a whole surplus of those that they're looking to get rid of, let me know. Captain Duckweed. You can find him on Instagram. <laughs> Excellent, Sam. All right. Well, uh, you know, I think we've uh, had a, a fantastic conversation about, you know, you and uh, your time in the hobby and uh, the work that you're doing as an as an aquascaper. Um, and then, you know, just a whole fun conversation around paludariums and some really good lessons for anybody that's wanting to start out. Um, so one last time, how can we get a hold of you? Um, and what's uh, let's give your, your shop a, a plug one more time. Absolutely. So. Uh, my again, my name again is Sam Rutka. You can find me at Captain Duckweed on Instagram, Sam Rutka on Facebook. Uh, Easy Aquariums is the name of the shop. We're located in Gorham, Maine, 664 Main Street, Gorham, Maine. Easy Aquariums. We've got a big blue metal roof. You can see us from space. <laughs> there you go. And even if you don't live in Maine, like if you're one of the, the East Coast listeners, um, you guys vacation up in that area in the summertime. So go check out Sam and, uh, you know, you, you'll know who he is because he's going to have the duck uh, duckweed in his beard. Yeah, just follow yeah. the trail. <laughs> Yeah, and we talked about it just a little bit um, in the show, actually more recently. Uh, but you know, the whole concept of the main whitelist and how you're, you know, on the committee that's just starting to take a look at this to try to hopefully enact some good change. Um, and you know, I want to tease the listeners that to me that is an incredibly important topic, um, not just for the state of Maine, but kind of the precedence for the United States that you know things could kind of go one way or the other depending on who the legislatures are and you know what kind of agenda they have to push uh, because you know the work that you're going to do is to try to remove this idea of a whitelist um, and as you corrected me a little bit ago the whitelist means that those are the only species that you can keep as opposed to a blacklist where it's just the few species that you can't keep so if you have a whitelist it is far more oppressive and restrictive than if you have a blacklist so um you know, if you want to give just a high level, like one or two minute little overview on that, um, you know, I don't want to go too deep into that because I want to have you back on in a month or two with a, a little bit more of an update. And we'll, we'll actually just kind of talk about that. Yeah. Um, so basically moving forward, we're, again, only allowed to have approximately 1% of what is usually available to the average hobbyist in the United States, in the state of Maine. Um, so Unfortunately, it doesn't look like in the foreseeable future we'll be able to switch it over to a blacklist. So as it stands right now, we're going to try and push forward and just add as 
many species as we can that we think deserve to be legal in the state of Maine that do not offer any kind of environmental impact or threat, uh, pose no biological implications or anything like that. We just want to add a whole bunch of species that should be allowed in the state and put them on the list so that we can sell them and hopefully increase the hobby a little bit more. For instance, we're not allowed to have any freshwater shrimp. We're not allowed to have any freshwater snails. We can only have two species of fiddler crabs and interesting selection of fish. So we want to we want to change that and, and make it a little bit more open, a little less oppressive, and see if we can get some more interest in the hobby and at the same time maybe a vested interest in the ecosystem that we live in and share with all of these animals as well. So we're just trying to trying to see if we can get more animals in and more people interested in and involved. Yeah, very important work um, because, you know, we don't want states to have a whitelist. And if they do have a whitelist, we want it to be, you know, as possible, you know, as inclusive as possible. Um, but again, you know, we, if you live in a state that doesn't have a whitelist, you don't want them to adopt a whitelist. Um, so, again, kind of the work that Sam's doing um, to, you know, have have animals added. Um, but then also, you know, maybe in the long term, get that whitelist removed is really, really important. Um, we've already talked about it more than I want to for this particular episode, but I think it's, it, it is such an important topic that it's hard for me, you know, not to ramble on about it and have Sam mention more things. So we'll leave that one for, you know, a few weeks out from now, maybe a couple months. Um, and we'll, we'll check back in with Sam and uh, see how the, see what kind of progress they're making on it. So Sam, thank you very much for joining me tonight on the Aquarius podcast. I really appreciate your time. Um, and I, I hope you enjoyed the, the talk. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. All right, Sam, you have a good night now. You too. Thank you again to Captain Duckweed for joining me for a really fun interview. I'm looking forward to having Sam on again to talk about his work getting more species added to Maine's whitelist of approved species. That does it for this episode, so get involved in your local fish club, help grow this wonderful hobby, and have fun with other fish nerds.